We sang that song today, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord Most High. And in Psalm 113, beginning at verse 1, it says, Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high? Who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth. Think about that. He's not in heaven. He looks down upon heaven. That's a different kind of a concept, isn't it? But that's what it says. He humbles himself to look down on heaven and earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, give us ears to hear which you have for us today, God, and grant me to speak your word in power in a way that changes our hearts and lives, changes us to be more effective for you, to fear you more, to love you more. And again, every evil spirit be gone in Jesus' name. You have nothing to do with this. This is the house of the Lord. Be gone. And Holy Spirit, have your way in our midst today, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You'll notice in your Bibles, if you have a translation, there are translations and then there are paraphrases. A translate... Excuse me. A translation attempts to render the original Hebrew here in the Old Testament into English while being as accurate and true to the original meaning as possible. Uh, a paraphrase, and they don't call them paraphrases, they, they call them some new word, I can't remember it now, living whatever, you know. But it's, they, they try to put the basic thoughts into English that people can understand. So when, when I'm a preacher, I want to go to a translation. So when I see the name Lord, I know that that isn't just supplied somewhere along the way to help me understand, but it's actually in the translation. The word for Lord here, you'll find it in your translations in all capital letters. Big L, then capital O-R-D. How many have that? If you have the King James, New King James, New American Standard, you'll have that. And uh, it translates the word Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H. -H. If you've been in institute class, you've heard this ex uh, explanation many times. But there's three words for God in the Old Testament. There's Elohim, which means Lord, which means, excuse me, God. Then there's capital L-O-R-D, which means Lord, Master, you know. And then there's capital L, capital O-R-D, and that's God's name. Unfortunately, we don't know how to pronounce it. The Jews decided somewhere along the way that our lips are too unclean to say the name of God. And so they took the consonants from his name, Y-H-W-H, and removed the vowels. So we can't pronounce God's name, even if you tried. And from that, people have come up with Yehovah and things like that, and, or Yahweh, which I prefer, but we're adding vowels to that, see, to make it make sense. And so as a result, to this day, we don't know how to pronounce the name of God. And 
throughout the Old Testament, he's emphasizing his name. And, you know, Aaron, put my name upon the people like this. And that's what I do at the close of every service. I quote from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which God told Aaron, put my name on the people by saying, Yahweh bless you and Yahweh keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you, etc. But we don't know how to pronounce it. So most people nowadays say Yahweh. Jehovah is kind of outdated. That came from combining the word for God, Elohim, with the word for God's name, and it came up to be Yahovah, <laughs> roughly, Yahovah. Now, do you know more than you did before? Let's read it, putting the name of the Lord in here, and I'll pronounce it Yahweh. Verse 1, praise, O servants of Yahweh. Praise the name of Yahweh. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its going down, Yahweh's name is to be praised. Yahweh is high above all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like Yahweh, our God, who dwells on high? Names are very important in biblical culture. In the New Testament, we have the name of Jesus. And it says that his name is higher than any other name that is named. People would use the name of their God to bless and curse other people. They would call upon an Egyptian goddess of death, Hecate, and say, Hecate, curse that guy. They would call upon the names of their gods. And they had a concept that some of the gods were more important than others, more powerful. And so you tried to serve a god that was more powerful than what your neighbors had. So when you cursed them, they couldn't curse you back and win the contest. It's silly to us who don't believe in that, but it's amazing how true it is that the uh, cursing and blessing are real things. That's why we don't want to curse somebody in the name of the Lord. Even if we use it just, as Becky was saying, as a swear word, if we're saying, God damn you, and things like that, that's a serious curse. You're wishing for God to condemn somebody to hell when you say that. Today, our names are just, usually they sound good. Oh, gee, we got a three-syllable last name here, Harrington. We better use smaller names for our first names. We don't want to have Abraham Harrington. It just gets too bogged down by the time, and then you put a middle name in there. Abraham Leroy Charles Harrington. We like names that sound good. Jim Baker, Johnny Wonder, whatever. But that's mostly, and some of us are named after uncles and grandpas and stuff like that. But most Americans just name people, their children for the rhythm, <laughs> how it sounds, how it rings off the tongue. But in the Bible, names meant something. God renamed both Abram and Jacob. Abram means exalted father. But God wanted to make a point. He renamed him Abraham, which means father of many nations. Every believer in Christ, in addition to all the Jewish people and Arab people that are physically descended from Abraham. There's all the spiritual children of Abraham, like you and I, if you're believers in Jesus. So he's a father of many nations. 
And God renamed him to make his name appropriate with that. Jacob meant a usurper. His brother was coming out of the womb first. They were twins. And Jacob grabbed him by the heel and pulled him back in and came out first. He usurped his brother's position as the firstborn. And so Rebekah named him usurper. But God said, no, out of the two brothers, he is the one that I'm putting my blessing and honor upon. Jacob have I loved, but Esau despised the love of the Lord. Esau sold, Esau sold his birthright, his, which was not the inheritance. It was the high priesthood of the family. And Esau said, what do I care for the high priesthood? I want the dough. I want the land. You can have the high priesthood, Jacob. Jacob valued that. He said, I'll give you something to eat. He was starving, Esau, was, thought he was. And Jacob said, I'll, I'll, I'll feed you if you give me your birthright. And Esau, like I said, he despised it. Didn't mean anything to him. Sure, I mean, a bowl of lentils. Oh, Becky made some lentils this week. They were so good. Anyway, Americans have not realized the value of lentils. But anyway, so, and Esau sold his birthright, the high priesthood of the family, from his generation to his children, to his children, to be passed down. He said, what does that mean to me? A bowl of lentils is worth more than the high priesthood of the family. And that's why God said, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Because he hated me first. He despised God and the gift of God. And God said, Jacob is not a usurper. He's a prince with God. He's someone I recognize and honor. And he named him prince with God, which is Israel. And he became the father of all the Israelites. So names are really important. When we say, blessed be the name of the Lord, we mean his name is worthy of honor and worship. Blessed be Yahweh, the one true God, the God who is. Turn with me to Exodus, if you would, chapter 3. Let me hear those pages rustling. We should quit doing this so everybody has to read their Bibles once in a while. Come on. Exodus chapter 3. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read... The first six verses, just to get the the feel of the whole story here. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Up until this time, it wasn't known as the mountain of God, but it became known as the mountain of God because of what happened when Moses went there on this day. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And he said, I will now turn aside and see the this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then God said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, 
for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord went on to say, I've seen the repression of my people under the Egyptians, and I'm sending you to deliver them. This phenomena that he saw of the burning bush was elsewhere uh, called the glory of God. The Jews had a name for it, the Shekinah, which means God's manifest presence. And it, at nighttime, it looks like a pillar of fire. In the daytime, it looked like a pillar of cloud. Ezekiel described it uh, dozens, if not hundreds of times, the cloud is mentioned in the Bible. Even places where the translators get it wrong, like in Revelation chapter 1, it says, he cometh with clouds, but actually in the Greek it says, he comes in the cloud. The cloud of glory. When Jesus was resurrected. He didn't get or uh, ascended to heaven. He didn't just ascend into clouds. He ascended into the cloud, the glory of God. The cloud that burned with fire and smoke. The cloud that says, God is here. He led the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness by that cloud. And when he appeared to people like to Ezekiel and, and others, and Moses right here, he appeared in that cloud. It calls him the angel of the Lord. The difference between this angel of the Lord and all of the other angels in the Bible is this angel of the Lord receives worship. The others say, no, no, I'm just a created being like you. Don't worship me. But the angel of the Lord, the word angel means messenger. And in the Old Testament, especially when the angel of the Lord appears with the cloud of God's presence, it's Jesus before he became human. It's the Son of God, pre-incarnate, before he became flesh. And that's why he receives praise, because he is God. Angels can't receive praise. Lucifer wanted praise. And so he talked a third of the angels into rebelling against God. That didn't last for more than a few seconds, I don't imagine. Because God threw them all out of heaven. But when the angel of the Lord receives praise, then that's the pre-incarnate Christ. Christ before he was Jesus of Nazareth. Then Moses says in verse 13, Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. I was hoping that would be powerful. Oh, well. I am. Forget it. I am who I am. Thus you shall say to them, the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Yahweh God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. The name of God, Yahweh, Yehovah, whatever. Isn't it sad? Doesn't that bother you that we don't know his name? 
But anyway, I guess he let it happen, so it's, it's all right. I am who I am. Who sh what's your name? I am. I'm the God that is. All the other gods aren't. All the other gods of men and, and nations are inventions of are actually probably fallen angels, demons. And it's amazing when I, when Becky mentioned India earlier, and when you look at the angels that surround the throne of God and they have four faces and, and one of them's a face of a cow and et cetera, a, a bull, and uh, you know, they're kind of parts of animals and parts of humans put together. And when you look at the gods of India, you got Ganesh, who's half elephant and half human. You got Hanuman, who's half monkey and half human. It's really kind of similar to Ezekiel's vision of the, the cherubim that protect the glory of God. A little bit confusing to humans, but makes perfect sense to God. And these ones, though, Hanuman and Ganesh and the rest of them, there's over 100,000 gods in India. Amazing. How do you keep track of all them? Well, you don't. You choose one. But, and they fit the description of some of those that we see in the Bible that are half animal and half human. These ones are the ones that followed Satan. When Satan said, I want to be on high. I don't want to worship God. I want to be worshiped myself. And he was beautiful. The Bible said he was the most lovely of all of God's creation. But then God created man and woman and he created them in his own image. And that's when Satan just, or Lucifer, just decided, enough! I'm not in the image of God. Why did he make these faulty little frail characters in his image? And I've heard some very uh, persuasive arguments that Satan fell after the creation of Adam and Eve because he was jealous that he wasn't created in the image of God like they were. Especially in the, in the sense uh, of the Hebrew uh, tense of the verbs and such. I don't have it fresh in my mind, but it, it was very, like I said, it was very persuasive. I too will be in the image of God. That's what he says in Isaiah 7. I too will be exalted. I too, you know. Because God had already exalted man to that point. Do you realize how awesome you are in the sight of God? He has exalted you to be in his own image. And I don't know exactly what that means completely. I think it means we don't have the head of an elephant and the body of a fat human. It means that we have a spirit and a soul and a body, that we're a trinity like God. I don't know how much further to take that, but we're created in the image of God. And that's such an awesome honor. And all the other so-called gods are just demons, fallen angels who rebelled with Lucifer. Lucifer is son of the morning, the bright and morning star that's also applied to Jesus because he's the true one. But uh, when he rebelled, he was no longer Lucifer. 
he was the enemy. Satan means the adversary, the enemy. Turn with me to John chapter 8. Okay, admit it, you didn't even bring your Bible. John 8, I'm going to begin reading at verse 48 and read to the end of the chapter. Again, it's a little bit longer than I usually, usually like to read from the Scripture. I was taught in Bible school that you don't want to page your people all over the Bible. You, you lose their attention, but rather pick the right verses and say them. But sometimes you just got to get the context. John 8, 48. The Jews answered and said to him, this is talking to Jesus, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? They, they couldn't stop him. He was doing miracles. The multitudes were following him. And finally, all they could do was stoop to name-calling. Here we are 2,000 years later reading how stupid they are. You're a Samaritan, have a demon. No, he was a Jew of the line of David and didn't have a demon, had the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my Father, and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Then the Jews said to him, Ha, we got you on that one. Now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead? And the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? And when you believe in Jesus, you will never die. When you keep his word, you will never die. You'll shuck off this shell, but the essence of you will be alive forevermore. As Abraham was. Jesus told in Luke chapter 16 the parable of Abraham's bosom and the rich man and the poor man. Abraham is in paradise greeting the, the people who believed in God who believed in Jesus. He wasn't dead. If you believe in him, you shall never taste death if you keep your word, keep his word. Jesus, verse 54, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. Jesus didn't pull any punches with these jerks. Then the Jews said to him, no wait, hold on. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, and went out of 
the temple, going through the midst of them. Isn't it cool how he could do that? Just all of a sudden walk out, and nobody saw him going out. Before Abraham was, I am. What's Jesus' name? I am. Yahweh. He's identifying himself with the God of the Old Testament. Because as I said, that, that's who he is. The I am, that are, and, and John says that in the first chapter of John. He said, no one has seen God at any time. But all of those Old Testament appearances and voices and pillars of cloud were the Son of God declaring him, the Word. And now he says it just as plainly as can be. Yeah, that's me. I'm Yahweh. I'm the God that appeared to Moses and Abraham, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. I'm the God that gave David the plans for the temple, Moses the plans for the tabernacle. I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He always is. He can't say, I was, I am, and I shall be. When we think of eternity, we kind of think of that, right? But he, he can't say that because it wouldn't be true. I am. There was never a time that he didn't exist. And there never will be a time that he stops existing. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all co-eternal, co-equal members of what we call the Trinity. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Also in John, up around verse 14, in chapter 14, and he turns to Philip. He says, show us the Father. Philip did. And he said, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am. I am God. I don't do anything except what the Father is doing. The Father and I are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I read the Bible every day, and I'm sure you do too. But I, I, I read the Gospels more than anything else. When I was a young Christian, I was trying to get all the doctrines down, so I was reading Hebrews and Romans. And, but now I just want to get to know Jesus better. And so I read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John again and again. When you know Jesus, you know the nature of God. You know how he feels about this and that and the other thing when you see him reacting with people in the pages of the scripture. Here's a woman caught in adultery, the very act. Moses said, Stoner, what do you say? He who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. And then he said to her, go away and sin no more. What, just a revelation of who he is and how he feels and how he deals with people. That isn't a license to sin because the first thing he said to her was, don't do it again. You know how he responds to human needs. When the Phoenician lady 
interceded for her child who had a demon, Jesus' first reply was, I'm not sent to the Phoenicians. The apostles he sent to the whole world. But he was particularly sent to Israel, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. They had been faithful to God all these hundreds of years, and they went up and down, of course, in their faithfulness. But uh, they deserved to be the first to hear. But nevertheless, he delivered her child that very instant. We know how he responds to human needs. We know how he loves. We know how strong he can be, too. He didn't have much time for what John calls the Jews and other gospel writers call the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they were hypocrites. They pretended to be spiritual and they weren't. They attended the synagogue and knew all the prayers, memorized all the right scriptures, but they didn't live it. And he had no patience with them at all. I have no patience with people who don't turn their phones off in church. Mine's probably on too. Nobody ever calls me. <laughs> but he had, he had all the mercy in the world for sinners who knew they were sinners and repented. Why does he cavort with prostitutes and tax collectors? Because they see their need. The big fancy churchgoers with their hypocritical lifestyle, they really think they're okay with God because they fool people. I never understood that. That was something that got drilled into me even as a child, that God knows everything you're doing. How can I be phony with God? How can I act religious before God if I'm not walking with him. But if you see Jesus, you know God. You know who he likes, who he doesn't like, who he receives, who he doesn't, etc., etc. Turn with me in closing to Ephesians chapter 1, please. I got so many notes in my Bible that Ephesians is about 30 pages long. Again, I'm going to read to get the context here, beginning at verse 15. Ephesians 1:15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Wow. I used to pray for that all the time. God, give me wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Not just a little head knowledge, but the real thing, the, the depth, the breadth. And that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe 
according to the working of his mighty power. You need to read this and get a feel for it. When I said, you know who you are? Wow, read this. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come, and put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Where are you seated, spiritually speaking? At the right hand of God. He is the head of the church and we are the church. So even if you're just a little toenail in the body of Christ, you're still seated far above all power and principality and name that is named. That's the demons that I mentioned earlier that people would curse themselves or curse their neighbors and bless themselves and in the name of their gods. All the names that are named. These powers, principalities, mights and dominions. The rankings of demons. And Jesus is far above all of them, and you and I are seated with him in heavenly places, chapter 2. Verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We have more authority than all those false gods. We don't need to call upon the name of some lesser God. We can use the name of the God of gods, the I am, Jesus. I'm not sure, but since Jesus came and gave us his name, Yahweh is fulfilled in that. That's the name that we use. He never said, you know, to the disciples, use the name of Yahweh. He said, but whatever you ask in my name, it shall be done. Because he is Yahweh, but he's the New Testament Yahweh. He's Yahweh in the flesh. He's Yahweh who died for our sins and rose again so that we can rise again when we die in the flesh. What a deal. The name of Jesus. The name of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord. What can we say, Lord, except thank you and fall before you and worship and honor you and keep your word. That's what Jesus had against the Pharisees. They didn't believe in him and they, they didn't keep his word. We want to be those who honor you, our Father, honor the Son and the Holy Spirit, and keep your word. Grant it, our God. In Jesus' name. Oh, Lord. 
This is how I want you to put my name on my people. The Lord Jesus bless you and keep you. The Lord Jesus make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen.